Hello everyone and welcome to this very special event which is part of our REBA Inclusion by Design Festival. My name is Geoffrey Milton and I'm the Executive Director here at the RIBA. Um, if you've been unable to attend um, or missed any of the events and today's, you'll be able to view it again um, on our website architecture.com. So today as part of a programme of events we are hosting in celebration of National Inclusion Week. As an organisation, we are working hard to ensure that architecture is equally open to all, regardless of their background or circumstances. Currently, we know it is not. We know there are discriminatory barriers preventing talented people from studying, practising or even appreciating architecture. And we take this seriously in our role in breaking down barriers and driving much needed change and doing that at a pace. As part of this, we're using our platform to share understanding of key issues. Our Inclusion by Design Festival is providing an opportunity to learn from global experts and thought leaders on a range of topics from race and gender, to social mobility, and today uh, we're looking at LG LGBTQ and inclusion. Today's event, Pride in Architecture, is a panel discussion organised in partnership with Architecture LGBTQ+. It will focus on the importance of these matters and inclusion and allyship in the workplace. So thank you all for joining today, whether you're on the panel or whether you're in the audience, I encourage you to join in the discussion, share your thoughts and insights. We're all here today to learn and I'm looking forward to doing so. On the panel today, we have um, a range of presenters. So we have Matthew Todd, multi award winning uh, writer, one time editor of Attitude, I think for about eight years, and his book Straight Jacket, uh, The Legacy of Gay Shame is something that I'm now aware of and want to have a good read of. Paris Lee, writer and campaigner and model, leading the fight for trans rights. Um, she writes in The Guardian through to The Telegraph. Gosh, that's a range. And she is a columnist for British Vogue. Maud Gober is a Zimbabwean lesbian who's a refugee here in the UK. For the last 15 years, she's been involved in LGBTQ um, community groups. She's a founding member of UK Black Pride and currently it's chair of trustees. And she is a project manager for Micro Rainbow for LGBTQ asylum seekers. And finally, Carl Straw is on the panel. He's head of HR and operations here at the REBA and has um, experience working in inclusion in his role at the BBC. So some housekeeping points. Um, you will get on to the speakers in a moment, but some, to cover some housekeeping points for today. We're recording the session so that if you can't join it others, or you want others to join it and have a look at it, you can pass on the link. We hope the technology works, fingers crossed with all our guys in the green room behind the scenes. Um, the event's going to, as I say, involve a panel discussion followed by audience Q&A. So please submit your questions using the Q&A function tab um, on the Teams um, system. And we'll do our best to get through as many questions as we can. We aim to finish promptly at four o'clock. We we started a couple of minutes late, so maybe we'll have some leeway on that. Um, so that's um, the running order. Before we um, get into looking at a short video from LDB, LGBTQ team, I want to say, make a statement myself about how as a gay man, I'm really proud to be able to host this Pride in Architecture um, event and play an active part in taking the agenda forward. Around the year that I was born, and I'm not going to tell you when that was, um, Peter Wildblood was in prison for soliciting, and this story has been recounted in a recent um, BBC docu docudrama. Gay men were uh, called against the law. Gay men were treated with aversion therapy to cure them, and that's in my lifetime. 
1968, as a result of the Wolfenden um, inquiry, um, sex between two men in private was decriminalised. However, discrimination continued. Pride in London was initiated as a campaign for grey rights, which I was heavily involved with over 30 years ago. At that time, we were filmed by the police and undercover officers. Hard to believe. We took the risk, especially as I hadn't come out to my family and in the workplace. So now pride has become a great celebration of the diversity of all the people within our rainbow community. And that's great. In 2020, it should be normal practice for us to LGBTQ people to be able to live, work and take part in all aspects of society. Whilst these rights have been hard won, we need to guard against losing them. And given the rise of nationalism and other dangerous forces around the world, I'd just like to make that point that this is a really important event today. So now I think we are going to look at the video. Hi, I'm Sam Kingsley and I'm on the Architecture LGBT Plus Committee. We are a grassroots organisation run by volunteers. We were started in 2016 by our chair Tom with a private breakfast, which we held at the RIBA, including a Q&A with the BBC's Evan Davis. Our mission is to provide a safe, inclusive and prejudice-free environment for LGBT plus architects and those working and studying within the profession through networking events, learning, mentoring and role models. In 2018, we launched a float competition with the LFA, which Hawkins Brown won, which we took to the Pride in London parade after our breakfast at the RIBA. In 2019, we ran our Pride collaboration again with the RIBA and LFA, launching a new competition with 33 practices entering. We announced our winning float at Borough Market. Rural Architecture Workshop won the competition and Sir Robert McAlpine realised their design. We also held our Pride breakfast with the ROBA at 66 Portland Place, where we raised money for the Albert Kennedy Trust, supporting LGBT plus youth homelessness. For the first time, we also took our flight to Manchester and started our network in the North East and Brighton with Pride Breakfast. In ordinary times, we hold events throughout the year with a mix of networking, talks and parties. In 2019, we were one of the lead case studies for the Mayor's Supporting Diversity in the Built Environment Handbook, with Tom presenting Architecture LGBT Plus at the launch. For the last few years, we have been holding discussions on intersectionality and race, starting with our Pride Breakfast in 2019, led by Diana Walker from Built By Us, and more recently, with a talk last year at Grimshaw's, and as a black lesbian woman, I was proud to be on the panel. During lockdown, we held a virtual discussion between the BBC's Ben Hunt and Kachanga, a black transsexual writer. We are funded by our sponsors who enable us to carry out our events and progress diversity within architecture. Hello, we're having watched that um, very interesting video. I'd now like to hand over to um, Carl Straw and the panel to start our panel discussion. Carl. Yes, hello there. Thank you, Jeffrey. And as Jeffrey said, uh, my name is Carl Straw. I'm the head of HR and operations here at here at the RIBA and have previously uh, worked at the BBC and the Law Society and have always um, had a very keen interest in um, progressing our own EDI agenda. So it's with great pleasure that I've been invited to be on the panel today. And as Jeffrey said, we've got three other guests uh, with us uh, today. So um, without uh, Further ado, I'm going to hand over to uh, Matthew Todd. Thank you to Carl. Thank you to Jeffrey. Thank you to Anne. Thank you to Reba for doing this. Um, it's been uh, great to to work with you guys. And I was touched by what Jeffrey was saying a moment ago, just about you know the kind of um, reactionary forces that are growing across the world. Because I think that's actually an incredibly important thing to to talk about. But um, we're here to talk about. Uh, the workplace and what it's like to be LGBT and and so on. And I think um, it's interesting when Jeffrey framed that a moment ago, just about, you know, his work 30 years ago on Pride. I think younger people in particular 
and and straight people and lots of gay people too lots of lgbt people wouldn't know that lots of people wouldn't know that until the equality act of 2010 it was actually entirely legal to fire somebody just for being lgbt in fact when i began my career um at stonewall um, in about 1994, I was answering phones. I would have been about 23, 24. It, you'd regularly be taking calls from people uh, who had been fired from their jobs, literally because someone had found out that they were gay or lesbian or bisexual on the whole. And I mean, there were so few trans people that felt they were able to to come out and live their authentic lives then as well. There were far less calls from trans people. So it's incredible that things have changed, you know, only only in in recent times. One thing, I wrote an article for um, uh, a website called totaljobs.com a couple of years ago, and I was really, really shocked, actually, to find out that um, even now, a huge proportion of people don't feel able to come out and be themselves at work. There was uh, a Stonewall survey in 2015, the LGBT work mm -hmm. survey, that found that 45% of LGBT respondents were not out at work, which I thought it was just a, a staggering number. And it feels that even though we've made all this progr progress, there still are people experiencing prejudice and homophobia and transphobia and sometimes intersections of all these different issues that come together. There was actually a recent study they did, a uh, more recent one in 2018, and found that more than a third of LGBT staff, 35% uh, of hidden that they were LGBT at work for fear of discrimination. And one in 10 black, Asian and minority ethnic LGBT employees, 10% have been physically attacked by customers or colleagues in the last year in, in their survey. And nearly two in five people, 38% uh, who were bi, weren't able to come out to anyone. And I think it's true, there's that old cliche, isn't there? When I was young, I was, I'm actually writing a book about this at the moment, about when, as I was coming out, I, I felt like I wouldn't be able to go into certain professions. I literally was thinking I want to go work in the music, in music industry, or maybe I want to go and work in the theatre industry, because there are some industries which are perceived as being more friendly than others. And in some cases, that's true. I think... Um, there was a study that found that 80% of lesbian and gay employees in the construction in the construction industry had heard homophobic comments in the workplace. And one in four LGBT teachers felt the need to hide who they were at work. And I think it is important, I'm sure that we will talk about this, about the way different things, uh, different issues intersect for people, different areas of prejudice. Um, there was a lesbian woman in one of the Stonewall reports who, who said about being out at work, she said a lot, a lot of lesbians don't want to put their hands up twice, once for, for being a woman, and then secondly, oh by the way, I'm a lesbian woman as well, and they feel that they've got their work cut out being a woman, let alone calling out that they're a lesbian too. That's what, that's what she said. And I think I'm aware that we're talking to lots of heterosexual and cisgender people as well. And I think something that we are beginning to understand is that this doesn't make business sense because people need to be able to be themselves. There was a 2015 report which estimated that £678 million pounds was being lost from the British economy due to the constant uh, retraining and rehiring of, of employees when LGBT staff had left their jobs. So obviously you need to then refill those places. My work um, has focused a lot on mental health. I um, was, you know, I joined Attitude after about two or three years of being at Stonewall in my 20s and worked, joined them as editorial assistant and then worked my way up and eventually clawed my way to the top job in 2008 and was editor from 2008 until, until 2017. And one of the uh, key issues that I wrote about at Attitude was about mental health. I'd had my own experiences of it growing up, not feeling very good about myself, noticing that there seemed to be a, a lot of people around me, be they people that I came out with when I was 16, people I was going to university with, um, people I was uh, working at Stonewall with, then people I was working at Attitude with who seemed to be suffering from depression. There were issues with drug drugs, issues with alcohol and anxiety. And I wrote about this in 2010 when I was the editor and at the time. It was considered to be a very, very sensitive thing. We weren't talking about the discrepancies with LGBT mental health uh, at that time. It was considered to be quite a controversial thing. And, and I remember when I told the staff we were going to write about it, that they were very worried that we might be offending our readers. But actually, we got the biggest post bag we'd ever received before or, or since from people saying, 
that's my experience. I don't feel very good about myself. How is this connected to, to, to sexuality? And since then, I think it's become really, really clear. There's many, many studies now that are showing all over the world that we have dis disproportionately high rates of depression, of anxiety, of self-harm, of body Im image issues, of eating disorders, addiction, depression, and suicide ideation and suicide. Now, I think it's really, really important just to just to qualify this as well, to say that the vast majority of us are coping with life like everybody else and having, you know, successful, happy lives. And uh, in terms of numbers, there are more people who are straight and cisgendered, you know, who, who are suffering from these issues. Of course, these are issues across society, as, as we know, and we, we talk about now. It's just that there is a disproportionately high level um, amongst LGBT people. And I think that it's becoming clear that there are a, a whole kind of range of factors that cause this. And I write about this in my book, Straight Jacket, about how when you're growing up and you start to realise who you are and what you are, sometimes people will tell you that before you've even realised it yourself. Then you go to school, you find it's obviously a place where a lot of us feel discriminated against, lots of us feel we, we can't come out. And there's this kind of experience of suppressing who we are which eventually that needs to come out in, in some way. But I think it's a key thing as well, that if people feel that they can't be out at work, that's a real, real problem. When I was a student, um, I, when I was about uh, 19 or 20, I was working, I worked at Sainsbury's, and uh, I remember there, I remember a guy that I didn't know whether he was gay or not, but I was thinking, looking back now, I, I think he was. He had bleached hair, he was very, very shy, very quiet. And he just was bullied the whole time by the guys there. I, there's no way I could have come out at that time. Then I went to work at cinema, which I, I had a great time. Uh, but there was quite a lot of discrimination there. There was a guy who was who, who just picked up on the fact that I was gay. I, I wasn't out to them at that point, didn't feel like I could come out, but bullied me constantly. And I remember the day that he was fired for something else was literally one, one of the best days of my life at that time. I think it's just really, really clear that if you can't come out of work, it contributes to mental health issues. People aren't able to be themselves and it affects uh, the decisions that young people make. And I think it's great actually that an organization like Reba is, is doing this because I think in itself, it shows where your values are and what values you are, are aligned with. And it's a signal to people to show that they can be themselves and they are in a supportive workplace. There's been many, many, um, I'll, I'll finish in one minute, but there's been one moment, but there, there's just been many, many examples now and people writing about this, like Lord Brown saying that this, this is an issue. And um, there's a guy, Steve Clark, who, who was CEO of WH Smiths, who came out a few years ago and he made the point, I think in the Telegraph, ironically, that it's really, really important for the whole workplace just to be out, just to be yourself. And I think sometimes I've even heard gay people say, I'm not going to tell people, why should I be telling people about my sex life? It's not about your sex life. It's about being like every other person in a company, just being able to acknowledge who you are. So, you know, when when someone comes into work on a Monday morning and another colleague says, oh, did you have a nice weekend? You don't have to you don't have to lie. You don't have to say, you know, you did something that you didn't do just in the same way that everybody else can. And um, there's lots of things we could talk about that could go on forever, but I'm sure we'll touch upon that in, in the Q&A. But thanks for listening. Hello. Thank you. And thank you there, um, Matthew, for the, your, your insights, certainly a number of which resonate um, with me personally, and I'm sure with lots of other people that are listening. Next, we have um, Maud, uh, who is going to talk to us about her thoughts. Uh, thank you, um, everyone at Reba and the team for inviting me to this platform. Um, I think what I can pick on, uh, thank you, Jeffrey and Matthew, for highlighting that there has been uh, progress, especially uh, since your work at the start of Pride, um, Jeffrey, and, and now there is progress with challenges. And that is one of the things why we started UK Black Pride, um, some of those uh, challenges in our moving forward, we have to re recognize the, the diversity within the LGBT community itself. And for us at Black Pride, it was not finding that, uh, that safe space. Um, when we think of um, the LGBT community, the challenges that we face, we tend at times to forget that there are challenges for others in, in, in different communities. Um, the challenges that I will face as a, a, a Black uh, 
uh, migrant and a lesbian are different from uh, the challenges that a, a black man or a white man or white uh, LGBT woman will face. Uh, often there is a, such a thing called rainbow racism. There is um, such on the community that we needed to find and create a not only because of racism, but because of different challenges, we needed to uh, create a safe space for people with the similar lived experiences and for their allies to 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 celebrate who we are and to still for us, it's still very much um, we are sort of still very much in the stage of it's still a political movement. We still have to speak out. We still have to amplify the voices of those who still um, encounter challenges. Um, I think um, picking on what something Matthew said, he talked about a lesbian woman who said that she would only raise a hand once because she doesn't want to bring up the other thing. But there are sort of those multiple intersectional challenges, say, for example, for a black woman, she has to contend with her race, her gender and her sexuality. And these are the, not the only challenges. There are such things as um, faith, age, class, all those things are struggles that are multifaceted for, for people, especially at work, and these vulnerabilities kind of overlap and create challenges of inequality. So we really have to be aware of who is within our circles, in our businesses, in our workplace, to see if, are we understanding uh, their challenges? I remember when I used to um, to work, I, I didn't feel free to, to, to talk about my sexuality. I would always edit my life. I couldn't bring my whole self to work. If somebody asked, or if people were talking about their partners as you do at work, um, I would always say they, because I didn't want to say she. I didn't want anyone knowing. So you find that you start editing parts of your life to, to, to fit in and you don't bring your whole self to work. And you sort of end up going into borderline uh, lying about your life or at least hiding. So it's not a, a healthy space to be because we spend a lot of our time at work uh, and has uh, Matthew sort of picked on, it, it does bring a lot of sort of uh, mental health issues because you're constantly having to hide. And if you're constantly also having to contend with um, perceived at times, um, discrimination because of your because of your race because of your faith you are always on guard it hasn't happened yet but you're always on guard and at times it it, it often hap it often happens not because it's it's intentional but because uh, uh, people are not aware of uh, the challenges that others are facing. People are not engaging with others to understand uh, other parts of them. They they understand what they know or what they can relate with. So we we'll end up with sort of this diverse workforce or this diverse um, uh, people in our businesses or in our places of work without thinking we can intentionally discriminate. Um, you know, they, they will as I said, are always afraid of that potential bias. They can be sort of disrespectful behavior. Um, we have to engage people. We have to interrogate some of these inequalities. We have to understand a person as a whole. Who are they? What challenges might they face as they come to work being a woman, um, being a disabled person, uh, being a, a trans woman, or whoever they are, when they bring themselves to work, we have to understand those um, potential inequalities. And to address this, we have to create environments where people feel safe to speak, and we have to be aware of those challenges. Um, we have to be ready to have the, the uncomfortable conversations. Often when you want to talk about, you know, things like racism and uh, and yourself being LGBT, people get uncomfortable and they're not open to learning. If you don't get uncomfortable and if you're not ready to have those difficult conversations, then there is nothing to learn. It's not only, you know, our diversity and inclusion should be part of the fabric of our, of our companies, of our businesses. It shouldn't just be in policy and in paper. It has to be 
in our environment. It's recognizing those, those who are marginalized, recognizing who's falling through the cracks of our support, uh, recognizing and, and appreciating those unique and different backgrounds. We're very diverse, as diverse as we are, our challenges are diverse. And it's also acknowledging those lived experiences that are not similar to our own. So I think maybe in, in concluding, I would say we should continue encouraging allyship, advocating and championing different issues that are not similar to our own. We're very different. If I'm different, I should learn to understand what are the challenges that my colleague might face. And uh, not only that, if I see that they, they, they don't feel safe to speak up, then you can support them in amplifying their voice or in speaking up or in creating a safe space for them to be able to, to, to speak. So it's, again, it's interrogating um, policies and practices and ensuring that they're inclusive and not only on paper, but in in action. Um, those diversity and inclusion activities and conversations shouldn't be left for Pride Month or Women's Month or, um, you know, Black History Month. We, it's a, it's a continual, it's, conti it's continual work. It's in the same way that our work is continual, our business are growing, we need to continue to engage and to have those all important conversations to understand each other and again to look at everything from an intersectional lens. I think that's it for me for now. Sorry about that folks, mute is on. Um, Maud, thank you very much for those insights. I really liked your point about editing your life my edit my life when you're at work and I absolutely get that one the amount of energy you have to put into doing things that are not positive but I'm sure we'll come back to that in a moment I now want to introduce she's got to us Paris over to you for your contribution please you're very welcome oh thank you for having us and uh, I'm so sorry about my technical issues at the beginning there um it's really great to everybody's perspective. It's a, a pity that I missed the start of Matthew's, but I have read his book twice, um, and uh, I, I think I, th I think I I, I understand uh, what he was talking about there. And it's really difficult doing these things because you know we're all here, happy, smiley today in a professional setting, and then. I guess I've been asked to talk about, you know, why I do what I do, what I do, what I do, and, and what I'm hoping to achieve. And it's really sort of rooted in being very unhappy as a child. And it's quite weird for me to talk about that stuff because I don't really see myself as a victim in 2020. Uh, but it's, it's very difficult to talk about that stuff without giving a bit of a soft story, really. And I think that my story is very typical of uh, many trans people's uh struggles you know if you did a sort of like checklist of these are the sort of issues that trans people are dealing with um you know bullying at school uh, family rejection um moving out uh, as a teenager and having sort of un unstable accommodation uh, you know get getting into drugs mental health issues all of, all of this 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 stuff that we know that lgbt kids are highly vulnerable to really and um Thinking really about how this pertains to a professional setting and, and just building on, 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 on Maud's comments about being included in the workplace and being intersectional and, 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 and getting the best out of everybody, which I absolutely support 100%. But I can't help but feeling like you've got to be in the space in order for it to be a safe space, right? And I, I'm... I'm still coming to terms with how many things I didn't feel that I was able to do because I was trans, right? And to, to, to give a sort of an, an illustration of that, I joined a gym about two years ago because I did a, uh, a, um, a survival uh, challenge and I, I realised how unfit I was. So it was my first time in a gym ever. And it just so happened to have a swimming pool and I used to love swimming when I was a teenager, absolutely loved it. It was my favourite thing in the world. And I saw this pool and I, I realised I haven't been swimming in 10 years. 
because I didn't feel that I was allowed to go swimming as 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 a trans woman. And um, you know, early on in my my, my transition, that kind of makes sense you know, because I was in a very different place and, and it can take a while to sort of blend in. And I realised that I took on a lot of stuff that was just, oh, you can't do this now. And over the past sort of two years, I've, I've, I've started to realise, you know, I didn't realise, I, I didn't believe that I deserved to be in a relationship and, and, and to be in love. I, I, I didn't believe that I could go swimming, that I could drive a car, that I should go on holiday. And, and this stuff sounds really crazy, right? It sounds really, 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 really extreme, but this is genuinely my experience. And I'm an incredibly privileged trans woman, um, you know, compared to an awful lot of people who, who are trans in, in Britain. So in order for me to be feeling like this, I think it's very easy to sort of underestimate the the low self-esteem and the, and the barriers both physical, uh, uh, structural and also mental that live inside our heads, sort of stopping us from progressing and being the best version that we can be of ourselves. And I, I guess I just think a lot about that that quote, and I'm probably going to get it wrong, but it's something like, what if the, the cure for cancer is trapped in the mind of somebody who couldn't afford to go to college? Right. And I actually was writing a polemic a few years ago, which I kind of scrapped to to focus on writing a memoir instead. But a working title for it was, um, you know, I, I could have been an astronaut because I feel like I've devoted my entire adult life to being an activist, quote unquote, and it, it really bugs me when people when when people say that because one of one it makes me feel like I should be uh, handcuffed outside the, um, the railings outside Downing Street with Peter Tatchell, but you know really I feel that all I've been doing is sort of asking people to be kind to to trans people and you know. It never, it never occurred to me that I could have gone and been an architect or a barrister or some, or, or something like that. So, I, I'm not sure what what the solution is for that. You know, and how how we let young people know that these are industries that they are welcome in, that that they are safe spaces and that they can progress in. But it just seems to me that there is this huge pool of untapped talent. That, 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 that isn't that isn't being accessed you know aside from the you know the the the, the moral argument and the, and and just the, the the sheer sadness of it the fact that there are people out there who who don't get to be who they could be and who who maybe they were supposed to be because they've been dealing with the effects of discrimination and a society that's been the, that's been really hostile to them so i think when I was at university, I didn't see any any trans people in the public eye that were presented as sort of positive role models. I say this all, all the time, but it, but it, but it's true. The only time I saw people like me, and even then it was only very rarely. But when we did pop up on the television, it was either as objects of pity, ridicule, or disgust. And I felt that I was good at English, I was good at reading and writing, and um, it was in 2009 I saw an article by Jermaine Greer in The Guardian in which she referred to um, ghastly parodies of women um, who wore too much eyeshadow, I'm quoting this verbatim, and um, who we all know are not real women, though it's not polite to say so. And I was very conscious as a student at university, sort of becoming political for the first time and looking, you know, reading newspapers for the first time in my life, that I didn't belong to that we. And I, I didn't know as much as I do now about the media, but I, I knew that this was a paper that was supposed to stick up for and promote the values of liberalism and, you know, it wasn't the sun, it wasn't a paper that sort of demonised immigrants and yet it was presenting a picture of people like me that I, I knew not to be true, that, that apart from being rude, which just wasn't accurate and, and, and didn't describe me. So 
my career's kind of been a, a mistake, really. It's just been a sort of reaction to that and thinking, well, I want to get my my voice heard. And um, it, everything's just sort of flowed up from that, really. And I know that there are pushes to change laws and there are things that we do need to update. But for me personally, I feel like we have a lot of laws in place already and, and, and a lot of companies already have great procedures in place for LGBT inclusion. So, so for me, I feel like it's been more about hearts and minds because we know that trans people are less than 1% of the population. And there was a study in America that always makes me laugh, which says that more Americans believe they've seen a ghost than spoken to a trans person. So for me, we really are dealing with ignorance, more, oftentimes more than more than prejudice or bigotry. It's it's just ignorance, which is why I'm really grateful to have any opportunity to to to, to talk to people who are, are open and willing to to learn more. And I I'm really looking forward to any questions that people might have. Paris, thank you very much for your contribution there. I think it's incredible to hear your uh, relating to not having gone swimming for 10 years and thinking about driving a, a car and holidays. Um, and I'm sure that that situation of feeling low self-esteem is something that will get picked up in some of the discussions um, and questions that we've got coming forward. Next then, Next up is Carl Straw, who's the head of HR and operations here at Reba. So, Carl, over to you. Thank you, Jeffrey, and thank you um, also to all the other speakers um, for sharing their own experiences and insights. Actually, being very moved by some of those experiences and but also in their confidence really in sharing those experiences and insights with all of us um very powerful so thank you for that um before i start i think it's really important to say that here at the riba um that we're listening and learning and that we recognize that action on inclusion and diversity um is critical to the success of the organization um, and we need to continually look at ways in which we can better represent and support uh, the LGBTQ plus uh, community. Um, but as for where we are right now as an organization, um, we're currently um, updating our own uh, diversity data. And our current data actually tells us that 6% um, of the workforce here at the RIBA identify as LGBTQ plus. Um, and as for data um, on our members, um, it's something that we're currently working on in terms of making changes to the membership application form and data collection moving forward. We don't currently collect the data, um, but we need to change that. And we've recently implemented a whole range of extra voluntary EDI questions on application forms. So positive move in the right direction but more to do um, as for data more broadly on architects uh, the architects registration board they hold data for 66 percent um, of the register and on their website if you check it out as at the 11th of august 2020 it says that 2.8 percent of architects identify as lesbian, gay or bisexual. So quite a low percentage actually across uh, the profession. And actually what I was also quite interested in was that they don't actually um, seem to record uh, transgender as a category, um, but also 18% um, um, are prefer not to say. So that's quite telling, I think, also about the profession. Now, Matthew also shared quite a lot of data, actually, in his um, presentation as well. And it's really important to understand, I think, the data across other professions and sectors. And that really gives you a sense of how, you know, different organisations and sectors are performing. You know, the data is really important. So all of this data, I think it really indicates to the RIBA and the wider profession that there's more work to do. So should we, we should never be complacent um, in that regard. 
Now, within the profession also, many of you would have um, already have been aware of architecture, uh, LGBT+, plus, and the great work they do um, as a not-for-profit organisation. And you saw the, um, the video there um, from Sam uh, Kingsley. Um, if you haven't already, I would encourage you to check them out online and they do some great things unfortunately you know we can't do all of the social stuff right now which uh, it was quite hard watching the video and uh, seeing all of that but uh, hopefully uh, that that can all change soon um as a hr professional um i've also got access to data insights and insights from my own professional body uh, the chartered institute of personal uh, personnel and development and much of that research tells us that lesbian gay bi and trans people don't also don't feel able to be out at work and you know there's lots of uh, research on this and it just generally shows a widespread uh, negative attitude towards lgbtq plus uh, individuals at work um, actually um, more than one in five uh, respondents had experienced a negative or mixed reaction from others because of their LGBTQ+, and over three quarters who had experienced a serious workplace incident related to their sexuality said they didn't report it because they thought nothing would happen or change. So there's some quite startling uh, data, actually. And um, finally, um, CIPD research in 2020 also found that those who had experienced uh, harassment at work, 13% reported that it related to sexual orientation and 4% to gender reassignment. I think all of us have a key role in creating a fair inc and inclusive workplaces. It's not just about one person or one team, it's for all of us. Certainly within HR, I think actions need to focus on instilling a belief across the organisation that diverse and inclusive workplace is part of its desired identity and not a nice to have. Um, promoting a culture of respect and dignity for all employees through effectively implementing policies and procedures. And I'd also like to talk about the importance of communication and training and, you know, employers need to communicate a firm commitment to LGBTQ plus inclusion and ensure equality and diversity policies and statements are easily accessible to all. Ensure that all employees understand their personal responsibility to treat colleagues with respect and make it clear that the organisation has a zero tolerance approach to bullying, harassment and discrimination. Ensuring that line managers understand their role in promoting inclusion and ensure they are trained and confident to challenge any form of inappropriate behaviour and also need to create a safe space where people feel able and confident to be their true self. And that came out in some of the talks from the other presenters as well. And then on the employment so practices side, I think really just ensuring that policies, processes, terms and conditions are fair and not open to discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. And also ensuring that the wording of policies and procedures is gender neutral. So, for example, things like paternity, maternity, parental leave, adoption leave policies, etc. should be explicitly inclusive of same gender partners and non-binary people. I think on a final point, I was really pleased to hear that all the speakers actually talking about uh, mental health. That's something that I'm really passionate about and how this can be impacted when we're not able to be our true selves, both inside and outside of work. Um, but in summary, I think there's um, a lot to think about and much, much more that we need to do. But by starting the conversation and listening and learning, I think we can all make a difference. Thank you. Thank you, Carl, um, for that update on the work that we're doing at REBA and um, giving some thoughts there about some of the structural things we need to do from an employer's perspective. Um, but I would say that, that it really is an inclusive and a collaborative thing um, that we at REBA um, for our own employees inside the uh, REBA organisation, but we have the responsibility there to support our colleagues that are working in practice, etc. 
Um, and that's where I think it's quite exciting to bring these things together and really to develop new ways of, 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 of collaborating and being, being in all of this together. Anyway, I think now we are over to um, the questions. We've got round about, I think, 10 minutes for these. Um, let's have a quick look at... Um, here's one from Danny, Danny Kerr, who asks, does the profession need to be more aware of trans lived experience of the job interview versus coming out in the workplace. Now, I don't know which panel member might like to pick up on that one. First of all, an obvious place would be to go to Paris, which is why I'm going to go somewhere else. First of all, Paris. So um, we'll come back to you in a minute. Lord, what do you think on this? I think we've just got a delay while we go over to you, Maud. Yep. Yeah. I'll, I'll try and in the future indicate who I'm going to ask the question to first. All right, apologies. Sorry about that. I might have to pull you back. Can you repeat the question for me? Yeah, sure. Does the profession need to be more aware of trans lived experience of the job interview versus coming out in the workplace? So I think that's really an understanding awareness there of trans issues and matters and having a sensitivity towards it. Of course, yes, they need they need to be aware of it um, beforehand. I think that's why I was saying yeah, instead of us having uh, the diversity and inclusion policies post, it needs to be a fabric of who businesses are, who workplaces are, because if they are aware of um, different people in our communities and societies, then that means uh, there won't be any kind of discrimination for uh, trans people when they come to interviews. They're already aware of um, their potential challenges. So it is something I agree that needs to be, um, the companies need to be aware of so they don't um, discriminate or then they don't sort of, um, so they encourage, uh, it's also about encouraging the, the right applicants. So I think it, Perhaps it shouldn't even start at the interviews. It should start in the way that jobs are advertised, ensuring that they they uh, mention that um, certain minorities should be encouraged to apply, um, outreaching to their communities, to uh, different organisations that can sort of uh, pass on those um, um, those job adverts, so that you you capture all the different uh, diverse talents. So it's from recruiting and ensuring that it's part of um, the organization's culture and fabric. Great, thank you um, on that, Maud. Over to Paris. Well, I've got a couple of thoughts on this. I think the first one is that, yeah, that's absolutely great. And I think that for me personally, I, I know that, uh, you know, I, I want to know that a company is explicitly trans inclusive trans it's not enough to just not be transphobic although that's a great starting point um but i need to know that it's a safe space and i'm not going to have issues there and, and that that comes from the top whether that's in you know your diversity and equality you know uh do, do, document documents or 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 you know how that's put across that it, that that needs to be there for somebody for who for whom that is important so that that's the first point really um, the, the, the second is that I can't help feeling, listening to this and having had these conversations before, that, you know, a workplace that is nice for LGBT people is generally just going to be quite a nice workplace for everybody, you know, and if, if, yes. if, if, if you've got a workplace where LGBT people feel like they're being bullied, it's probably not actually going to be a very nice workplace anyway. Uh, you know, particularly for women or, or 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 anybody really, which which kind of brings me on to my third point. And I'm sorry to sort of like like go big big picture on it, but but I can't really divorce m my thoughts on the answer to this question with with where I feel we're at sort of culturally. And I, and I think that you know just again, it it's it's all very well you know making people feel welcome at the sort of interview stage, but 
we are living in a society where almost half of young trans people have attempted suicide. So we're not talking about have joked about or, or threatened to. We're talking about young people sitting there trying to take their own lives. So for, for, for me, it, we, we, we can't talk about the sort of workplace policies without realising that, you know, we need to see changes in our society. And as I mentioned before, we're less than 1% of the population. And I encourage everybody who's listening to this, you know, I don't expect you to go out and become a, an activist, but, you know, please, if, if, if there's something that you can do, if you're able to donate to a charity, if you're able to have a conversation with somebody and change their mind, if you're able to offer some support to somebody in, 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 in your life, you know, everybody knows somebody who knows somebody who knows a trans person these days, like, that is literally where we're at, you know, it's, 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 it's very much life and death for, for people. And I, I know so many talented people who, again, without wanting to be too heavy, but who just haven't made it through the past decade, you know? Um, and, and, and so I, I just, I just, I just feel like it's worth looking at that sort of bigger picture because I feel very much like, I don't necessarily want to be in this country at the moment because things are becoming so hostile towards trans people and the only way that we're going to change that is a wider cultural change of which welcoming workplaces is a really important part but basically we need you all of you thanks very much um lee um, Matthew, have you got anything to add on this? Uh, just, uh, can you hear me? That's the thumbs up, isn't it? Yes. And um, just, just, yeah, just echo what what both of uh, of our other panelists have said. Um, I was just thinking that sometimes we're, I, I'm sure it's the same for Maud and Paris that we we do quite a lot of these kind of events. And sometimes you go to companies where they talk about this idea of equality and treating people well, like this phrase, the moonshot, that's been used quite a lot. Like it's this really hard to do you know, incredible aspiration when it should just be normal practice for, for all companies. But, and, and lots of them have been doing it. I was just thinking, I remember when I when I worked at the cinema that I mentioned earlier, which would have been 92, 93, 94, we had a staff meeting. We had reg regular monthly staff meetings and the managers told us there was a transgender man coming to work at the, at the company and were very hardcore about, we must treat him with absolute respect and it's very moving when I think about that, because that was 30 years ago. And we did. And John, it wasn't that wasn't his name, but he came and was part of the, the community and, and really flourished because it just wasn't an issue. And, and so, you know, these things can be done. Great. Thanks very much for that, um, Matthew. Um, I've got another question here. Let me just go back to them. Hold on. Sorry, guys. Um, another question here is about um, what can tutors and schools of architects do to support um, students from um, our rainbow communities? Uh, I, I, well, I, I dropped out of college and ended up getting into a lot of trouble and I actually ended up in, in Young Offenders Institute when I was 16 and my college tutor was absolutely wonderful and she wrote me letters to the judge you know saying that I shouldn't be sent away and that I got a lot of promise and that I was a good student and everything but it, you know I still got sent away but she was really great and she helped um she helped get me out early on on curfew and and she helped get me in registered and enrolled so i think i sort of i think i was released early in september and then i i literally in, enrolled straight away like you know as soon as i came out and and, and went straight to college and um at a university i nearly dropped out at least once possibly twice and I, I, again, I had another really good tutor who took it into account and she thinks she gave me an extension on um, my dissertation. 
because she understood that I was really, 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 really struggling. And they arranged for me to have therapy and everything. So I just think that you shouldn't underestimate, even if it may not be apparent on the surface, the sorts of struggles that people might be going through some really 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 big struggles which may present as personal struggles but are actually the effects of you know being grow, growing up being bullied and, and being told that you're not good enough or being kicked out of home or whatever which which sort of manifest as like personal failings right um and and so I think don't underestimate the impact and the power that you can have on a young person's life because I very nearly didn't make it at so many different points along my journey. And I remember those people. I remember those tutors. I remember the youth workers. I remember the first person who employed me, you know, paid me for my writing. Um, you, you can make a real difference to an individual young person's life and, and heaven knows they, they need it. Thanks for that, Paris. Over to Carl briefly, yeah, and then thanks. we'll have one more question. Yeah, thanks, Jeffrey. Um, yeah, I don't really have much more to add. I think, you know, Paris and Matthew have given some really fantastic responses there. I think the only thing I would say is that in addition to all of that is that really, you know, it's about asking them actually what they would want yeah. rather than making that huge assumption you know which you know we can sometimes do you know certainly you know within HR you know occasionally you know we might be doing things that actually you know we assume that we know what everybody wants and you know just because I'm a, a gay man for example doesn't necessarily mean that I understand everything relating to LGBTQ plus and everything else, you know, and so it's really important that, you know, I'm a great believer in that continuing to sort of listen and learn and, you know, creating that so safe space so that people can talk about it. So that would be my sort of additional view. Thank you, Carl, um, for that one last quick round, quick fire question that's come up here. Um, there's, I should say um, there are so many questions coming through that we're going to have to look at these and see how we can respond to them and put them up online, the answers and so on, and advice and support people are looking at. It's absolutely fantastic. But there's a question here just to close with, and we'll go around the panel, um, perhaps starting with Carl, then Maud, then with Matthew and finally with Paris. And the question is, how does the panel think social class affects the way in which LGBTQ plus people are treated? So that's broadening it out. Um, so off we go. We've probably got about two minutes each. Yeah, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, wow, interesting question. Um, I think, of course, it affects, you know, social mobility affects everybody. You know, it isn't just about L LGBTQ+, um, actually. And so I think that's why, you know, we had the session yesterday on social mobility. So check that out if you've not listened to that already. But I think, the you know, my quick answer would be that you know, clearly, you know, they are going to be affected, but I don't necessarily think it's just because of their sexual identity. Um, you know, it's much bigger and much more complex. And yeah, I'm not sure that I can answer that in the sort of 10 seconds I've got. <laughs> so it's now you, Maud. Um, I think, uh, like um, Carl said, it's such a heavy question and it, it won't take 10 seconds to answer, but it, 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 class does affect. It's one of those um, that I spoke about at first, that it can be an intersectioning, cha an intersectioning um, challenge that can cause inequality because of someone's background and, uh, and class, that they will miss out on opportunities, that they will miss out on, on trainings, that they will miss out on on a lot of things depending on um, the career that, that they are in. Um, I remember a friend of mine who's a, 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 an African, a, a lesbian and a, a 
um, she was going into forensic psychology and she came upon a, a lot of barriers and she felt it was because of her class, because she had accent and all her other colleagues had gone to uh, this certain uh, privileged universities and she, she felt very uh, um sort of um she it, it was quite a challenge that in the end um she 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 sort of diverted her career and is um doing a phd in something else so they they there's a lot to be discussed there we wouldn't be able to cover in 10 seconds thank you mort i think it's now over to matthew Hello, can you hear me? Good, 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 good. That is a huge question. And I saw Paris yes. uh, light up because we talk about this a lot, class. And I think actually it, it, it's the one uh, categorization that doesn't come up when we talk about diversity and inclusion. It never, I mean, it never comes up. I'm so glad that it has today. In my experience, uh, my class, I, mean, I come from a working class background. My dad was a bus driver. My mom was a secretary at a PA and a cleaner. Uh, no one had been to university. I didn't know what university was. My parents didn't un really understand. I didn't understand that you go away to it. And so I stayed at home. Um, it's been more restrictive of my career uh, cl class th than anything, certainly to, with my sexuality. I've had to m continually make opportunities to for myself because there's been a presumption in, in, I'm making it sound very like, like this victim. That's not the case, but it's definitely been a, a barrier. And I see it Paris and I talk about this a lot in the media, in film, in the music industry. Fashion is slightly different because there's a lot of working class kind of creatives that, that come up from the ground level. But it, yeah, it's a huge, huge issue. And I think it's something that, that should be talked about because working class kids get told by everybody that you won't succeed. We don't expect you to succeed. We don't expect much of you. And I think that is one of the most devastating things you can ever say to anybody. Thank you. Thank you. Now it's over to you, Paris, for the final word on this one. I might need to do another hour-long presentation. Um, so would I. I uh, oh gosh, yeah. I mean, I, it's so complicated, all of this, and I feel like, in many ways, um, class has held me back more than than my gender identity. And in in some ways, we, we, it's so because it, it, a lot of it is like a paradox. Like it gives with one hand, it takes away with another. And it, it's it's occurred to me that whilst you know being trans, I'm not just talking about in terms of discrimination from other people, but just those sorts of like barriers, you know, that you're wasting time trying to access healthcare and all this this sort of thing, and then the you know the mental side of it um, is. Uh, you know, be, being trans is almost a bit like being a, a pop star, you know, right? So, so it's like then nobody nobody thinks about your class. You know, we're like rock stars, like Mick Jagger, and or, I don't know if he's working class, but pe people like that. It almost like gives you entree into this sort of like world, you know, like because when I went on Question Time, for instance, it was like, oh, it's the first trans woman who's been on Question Time, and it's almost like people can't see the working class because when you're a trans person, you're just a trans person, right? But it's kind of like nobody from my hometown goes on question time you know it was quite a big deal as a working class person going going on there so in in some ways i feel like the, the transing has acted as a sort of invisibility cloak for the fact that you know i'm, I'm working class but i've definitely come up against discrimination for, for, for being working class in, in in my career in journalism and you know it's interesting that i've written for the for the for the sun and the mirror but i haven't written for the observer you know um but but what I would say is that I feel like I've done a lot of really sort of radical honesty during this this um, this this uh, I want to call it a zoom it's not is it and like it's a bit like throwing a dead cat down on the table and it's like okay what do you want to do with that now but I'm I'm really into talking about the reality of of of, of, of people's lives and and the truth is that. I wouldn't be here talking to you today. I wouldn't have been invited to speak as, as, as who I am in 2020 um, if it, it weren't for making some really difficult decisions along the way. And the fact is I had sex for money when I was a student to put me through university. You know, because my family weren't supporting me and I didn't have any money. 
I would not have had the career that I've had now if it weren't for a nice middle class man who was a banker in Canary Wharf allowing me to live with him for free and essentially supporting my activism and supporting me to do unpaid internships. So it would just be really disingenuous of me to, to pretend that, you know, well, I, I, I got here and I made it through. The, the, the fact is, without some help or without taking some extraordinary measures that talent and creativity if I have any talent and creativity would be perhaps in my hometown you know and and I just think about how many of the people who are, are not at the table because of that. So I think class is so important. I'm so glad that the, the 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 question was 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 brought up and it's annoying because working class people are told, you know, basically just get like the scraps from the big table. And then if you happen to be a person of colour or you happen to be a trans person or you happen to be a gay person, you may not even have a seat at the, the, the table where the scraps are being fought over. So um, I, I, I hope that we can be part of changing that in, in, in some way. And of course, that's what we're all pushing for. So, uh, yeah, thank you for giving us a space to talk about all of this stuff. Yes. Thank you, Paris. I'm glad for that question. Uh, thank you. I'm not hearing you, Geoffrey. Sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, yes. sorry. I just want to go around once more to the panel to give them their final minute maximum of thoughts for um, our audience to take away this afternoon. We're well over time, but um, starting off with Maud. Um, thank you for um, in the invitation to the panel. There have been so many things that I think we could all go on and on in, in, in discussing. And like you said, we will get the opportunity to answer the questions. All I can leave people with is, um, uh, you know, go out there and become an ally for something that you don't identify with, something new. If you're a, a, a straight man, uh, go and become an ally on trans issues or an ally on LGBTI asylum seekers issues or an ally with the uh, UK Black Pride. Find something to, to champion, find uh, voices to amplify, use your privilege to, to, to ensure that... Um, you amplify the voices of others and you you create uh, safe spaces and always challenge ignorance or always engage in, in debate to educate and always um, be open to learning. So um, if you have any questions, we are there, UK Black Pride or Micro Rainbow. Uh, there are different organizations that you can just, you know, at the click of a mouse on Google, you can find organizations to find answers or to ask questions. Thank you. Now it's Carl. Yep. Hi. So I think for me, it's really just about continuing the conversation. You know, um, there'll be a lot of people that have dialed in today and hopefully, you know, th there'll be a lot of takeaways that, that people can think about and, you know, can follow up on, you know, whether that's something about that's more procedural or policy uh, related um, in their organization or whether it's something about, you know, the environment in which they're working and making sure that they create um, the space for people to have that conversation. I think it's really important that this should not just be a once a year thing that we think about at Pride or Black Pride. It's it's every day, every hour, every second. You know, it's really important that it's a cultural thing, and there is so much more to do. So I would just encourage people really just to carry on listening, carry on learning, and just you know sharing their experiences, and hopefully you know all of that will just continue to make progress. Thank you. Great, thank you, Carl. And now over to Matthew. Hello, can you hear me? Is Paris live or am I live? You can hear me, yeah? Good. 
You can hear me? Wonderful. Um, yes, I agree with um, Carl and Maud. I won't go over saying the same thing. I mean, we didn't talk much about the consequences of, me of mental health. I realised when I was uh, editing Attitude that I had had for quite a long time a kind of dependence on alcohol. I'm in recovery for that. I haven't had a drink for six and a half years. And I say in my book just about the LGBT community that we need to make the language of recovery central to uh, LGBT culture as kind of, you know, Beyonce and Kylie and Lady Gaga and Madonna and all the rest of them. But I think it's really important people in a workplace understand that across the board, be you LGBTQ, heterosexual, cisgendered, whatever, that talking about mental health and well-being at work. Paris made the point that a, a, a workplace that is supportive of LGBT people is going to be a good place to work on the whole because of the values that it has. But just lastly as well, because um, you spoke, um, Jeffrey, at the beginning about mm -hmm. The difficulties we're facing. Just anyone who follows me on social media, I uh, just talk about in a, in a, talk about issues in a, in a wider way. We are being tested at the moment. We're about to be tested. You saw what Donald Trump said uh, last last night. There is a real clash coming. We have an ecological emergency, which everyone, the whole culture, has denied for a long time. It's coming. There's no two ways about it. David Attenborough's documentary is out this weekend. When societies become stressed, people who are different get the blame. And I think we need to understand what's about to happen. And so events like this and the values that we all share, we need to defend them. And I think we're going to have to defend them very vigorously. So I think we need to come together and uh, focus on that. Thank you very much, Matthew, for bringing us right up to date with. Uh, thank you, Matthew, for bringing us right up to date with current affairs and so on. Um, it's been a fantastic range of questions and insights and panel members. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, most of you I've not met before and it's been a real privilege to um, host this with you and to our audience out there. Thank you very much. Watch out for on Reba social media and on our online some of the um, answers to your questions and the sorts of things that we've been discussing and also to identify what we're going to do next. I think for me it's about collaboration. Um, it's also about what we can realistically do um, that's sustainable in all senses to keep the conversation, but more importantly, to get some actions going um, from this. So I'm very keen that we hear from you and thank you very much for your time today. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>